Let's go to mobile nets. So far, what methods did we cover? We covered uh, uh, knowledge distillation, where you have a large network and you're distilling the knowledge in a smaller network. We covered pruning and quantization. We covered quantization to the extreme, to zeros and ones. We learned about squeeze nets, which were similar to inception. The idea was to use one by one convolutions. Now we are gonna see another nice idea. We haven't seen this before. Let's take a look at the details of the computational cost of a convolution. Let's say that's your input features. You have a feature map of size df times df times m. These are the resolution, the first two, and the last one is the number of channels. The output, let's assume your striding is one and you're doing padding appropriately so that the resolution doesn't change. You're still having the same resolution, but then the number of channels is gonna be different, the number of feature maps. That's your input, that's your output. And what is a convolution? You're gonna need this much, uh, this many numbers. That's the size of your filter dk by dk, and then you're, need, you're gonna need to go from dimension m to dimension n. So that's the total amount of numbers that you're gonna need, dk by dk by m by n. That's the total number of elements that you need to store. In terms of computation, if you do a striding and padding correctly, and you ignore that, that's the formula for a convolution. Uh, you want to know the entry k, l, n of your output, entry k, l, n of the output, it's gonna be a dot product of your kernel and your input on a sliding window on your input. And the sliding window is gonna be uh, determined by i and j, okay? So i and j are gonna be the first two entries of your windows, and then you're sliding it. You're just adding it to your input locations. So you take your input at location k plus i minus one, L plus J minus one, and you take the mth uh, feature map, and then you're just multiplying it by that. That's a detailed explanation of the convolution. So is everything clear? And why is it sliding? Because you're starting at point K and L, and then you're sliding it. You change K and L each time to give you the next output. Now let's see what is the computational cost. You need a for loop on I, you need a for loop on J, you need a for loop on M, so it's gonna be dk by dk by m. That's the total number of operations for this summation. And then you need another for loop to give you the outputs. Actually, you need three other for loops. You need a for loop on k, which is df. You need a for loop on l, which is gonna give you df. And you need a for loop on m. So that's the total cost. dk by dk by m by n by df by df. That's the total computational cost of a convolution, okay? How can we make that cheaper? And that's, the, that's where the idea is gonna come in. Rather than uh, having a different N and doing a matrix multiplication over there to go from dimension M to dimension N, you do your convolutions channel-wise or depth-wise. It means that you're gonna keep M fixed. It's for the same M, M, and M. So there is no for loop on M and there's gonna be a for loop on I and J and K, L, and M. Now your depth-wise convolutional kernel is gonna have this dimension. It's gonna be dk by dk by m, rather than being dk by dk by m by n. So we already saved some in terms of storage. You only need to store dk by dk by m numbers. And then we are storing, we are saving one for loop. You don't need to do your for loop on n anymore because we are doing it channel-wise. So that's gonna give you dk by dk by m by df by df. So we got rid of n by that trick, by doing it channel-wise. But then we still need to combine things together. And how are we gonna do that? That's the idea that we saw before. It's the one by one convolution. But what is the cost of a depth-wise separable convolutional channel, convolutional uh, kernel or operation? This we know, this is exactly what you have up there. Plus, we are gonna do some other operations and we are gonna do one by one con convolutions there to go from dimension m to dimension n. And because it is one by one convolution, dk is one, dk is one, and you're gonna end up with m times n by df by df. That's the cost of a one by one convolution. So we are getting rid of dk by dk. So any questions so far? I think visually speaking, 
ignore this part for now. Visually speaking, this is a standard convolution. You have n filters of size dk by dk by m. That's exactly what I wrote here. For depth-wise convolutions, m is 1 and n is m. And we are doing things channel-wise. We are multiplying each filter by its corresponding channel. So we do not mix stuff during convolution. But then we need to go and mix the channels together. And that's how you're going to do it with one by one convolutions. Because, because in the end, we want to go from dimension M to dimension N. So you do one operation of that and another operation of one by one convolution to replace a three by three convolution. You have a three by three convolution, bash no value, and then you can replace that by a three by three depth, depth wise convolution, batch norm ReLU, and then another one by one convolution, batch norm ReLU. So these are gonna, in the end, give you the same dimensionality for your input and output. The dimensionality is gonna be exactly what you have here. Any questions? So this idea of depth wise or channel wise convolutional kernels are really powerful to save computation. Now we're gonna introduce two multipliers. One is your width multiplier, because we want to have a parameter to tune the capacity of our, of our network, depending on the target network, tar target device. So you're going to introduce two parameters, a bit multiplier, which is going to control the number of channels, M and N. And we're going to have a resolution multiplier, which is going to control the resolution, the size of the resolution. I think we are over time. For those of you who have questions and would like to stay and ask, I would be happy to stay and answer. And for those of you who want to leave, you're more than welcome to leave. I have a, a question um, about the XNOR network. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically just about that, uh, those figures at the end um, with sort of the efficiency, I guess, or like the speed up. Um, okay. So when you're looking at um, like the number of channels, for example, are they just measuring that as... Like if they just look at one point in the network where there happens to be an input of some input with 32 channels, and then they just measure the speed up there versus the the basic network, like the is what I'm making sense, saying making sense. Uh, uh, I think because like you're not gonna have an image that has like uh, 32 channels. Oh no, these are the uh, intermediate operations. Yeah, so they just like in your network, you just look at certain layers that have certain uh, diff varying, uh, varying inputs with varying uh, channel number of channels, and then you just measure the speed up at that layer. So if you look at, for instance, VGG, it has a particular structure, okay? It has inputs, and then it has a convolution. It has multiple convolutional layers, and then in the end, you get your softmax and probabilities each one of those convolutions, you can do these operations on, you can compress them. Mm -hmm. So whenever you have a convolution, this, these are the operations that you do on them. And in the end, for your entire network, you are gonna save uh, some amount of computation and some amount of storage. For instance, for VGG, for that particular structure from one gigabit, you're gonna go to 16 megabyte, okay? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It's, yeah. it's not only the input. It's every single channel. Is yeah, yeah. I mean, every that's single cool. layer. Sorry to jump in. Is this similar to with um, when we were looking at quantization? Uh, maybe one or two sessions ago, we we had explicit formulas for how much you can save given yeah that that R compression ratio. So we had like a given formula there, and we knew exactly if if these are the the parameters, this is how much we'll save. It's probably similar here, like given unknown hardware and given then unknown filter size, channel size, the different parameters, you can say that that, that hardware will be able to, to run it 41 times faster now. Yeah, you can just do it analytically instead of uh, sort of like experimentally. Yeah, so I'm, I'm guessing that those figures are formulaically generated and not experimentally generated. Actually, it's more straightforward for binary networks to store a single floating number, you're gonna need 32 bits, mm -hmm. okay? To store a binary number, you're gonna need one bit. So it's very simple. You go from one to 32. That's the amount of memory you're saving. And then it's not gonna change whatever else that you do because 
you still need to store binary stuff. So from 32 bits, you're going to one bit. And that's where 32 is coming in. And that's your compression rate. Yeah, I'm, I'm more interested in, or I guess I haven't seen before, the speed ups for like one um, X naught or operation versus one flop, whether it's addition or subtraction. So I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled by the, or just don't know the details of the going from two times computational savings to 58 times computational savings. Oh, so you're talking about this. You're mm -hmm. not talking about the storage because the storage is very clear. Yeah, and same thing, same thing in the diagram down on the right, that that's talking about speed up and not memory. But this uh, compression rate that you were referring to in your question, mm -hmm. that is for memory. Yes. These are the math that you know for the memory. Yes. Even these numbers here are for the memory. But for the computation, you're right. How do you go from 2 to 58? It's because of the way that XNOR can be implemented very efficiently. I guess you can implement them with shift operations. You just shift your bits left and right, and then you get X number. And so then going back to the original question, that's, that's something that given knowledge of like computer hardware systems, you could write down an explicit formula for the amount of computational savings. I think you can, yes. Yeah, that makes sense. For computational savings, you can exactly do it. Because you know yeah. an addition in the end is going to have to trans translate into a bunch of bitwise operations and XNOR is one of those bitwise operations. So yeah, for that one, we have to sit down and exactly write it down. But uh, I'm happy to take the paper's words on it and say, okay, it's 58 times. Thank you. That, that helps a lot. Any other questions? So there is a question from Omar for mobile net. Why don't we just do the same thing we did in the inception module with dimension reduction? I mean, what is the advantage of doing this? compared to doing the same thing, but having the one by one convolution be first to reduce the dimension. So it's a slightly different paradigm. When you were, when you were doing dimension reduction, you were saving computations uh, channel-wise. But now what we are doing here, we are saving computations uh, in, a different pa in, in a different fashion. If I want to show you the details, with one by one convolutions, you still have to do matrix multiplications. And that's going to be the cost. M, the size of M and N still are going to come into play. But with channel-wise or depth-wise convolutions, you are getting rid of N. So it's a slightly different paradigm. And you can see the difference here. This is a depth-wise uh, convolution. And that's what you get from 1D, one, one by one convolutions. Does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. Any other questions? 